These are earth-shaking fires. A special breed of firefighter snuffs them. Specialists who blow out raging infernos with explosives and cap fountains of highly flammable oil or gas without blowing themselves up. Now, oil firefighting on Modern Marvels. Welcome to disaster. It doesn't get any worse than a raging oil or gas well fire. Choking, burning smoke shoots hundreds of feet into the air. Without protection, the heat can cook a person's skin several yards from the blaze. But once it's out, it's even more dangerous. The specialists work to cap the blowing well under a shower of flammable crude. Standing beside a blowing well is like placing your head next to a jet engine, only louder. They're so loud that you put cotton and Vaseline in your ears, and then you shove an earplug in behind that. Only a handful of men in the entire world are qualified to put out a fire like this. You got to be careful. Nobody makes a mistake. Because it's not just jumping and do this and do that. It's a lot more to it than people think. Every well fire presents unique problems, but the basics of the job are always the same. Put out the fire and cap the blowing well. To avoid being incinerated while doing their incredibly dangerous work, experts use specialized tools and methods perfected over the last 70 years. First of all, you have to gain ready access, safe access for the people to do the work. If there was a drilling rig and it caught fire and is burnt up, it means first of all, the, the safe removal of all that debris from around the well. Firefighters use bulldozers to drag away the twisted wreckage of a burnt up rig. They also use an athe wagon an A-frame trailer with a long boom and a hook on the end to grab debris. So we have to take it away a piece at a time, because if we do put it out, uh, a one hot piece of metal could reignite the well. Giant pumps spray a deluge of water over men and equipment, protecting them from the intense heat. This is one of our bigger pumps in our inventory. This is a uh, 5,000 gallons per minute pump you got the engine as your uh, driver, the transmission, and the pump itself. Often the only thing between these firefighters and a raging inferno is a 1 8 inch piece of tin. Well, out of all the equipment we've got, uh, from expensive to the cheapest and the smallest thing, this is probably one of the best fringes you could possibly have when you're on a, on a rig fire. Uh, it's a typical corrugated tin. There's a lot of barns built out of it, same type material. The shiny galvanized sheet metal reflects heat. Firefighters also use it to protect equipment. As long as you've got water and you've got a piece of tin, you can stand up and basically touch the fire. There are many ways a disaster like a blowing, burning well could ignite. An errant spark, lightning, or the friction of blowing debris. It can even happen before a well begins producing. When sinking a well, drillers may have encountered greater than expected pressure from the oil reservoir trapped underground, leading to the failure of surface containment equipment. When the flow of crude is uncontrolled, that's a blowout. And at any time, that combustible oil or gas can catch fire. Traditionally, one of the most effective ways to snuff a fire has been to literally blow it out using explosives. It's simply robbing it of oxygen. You place that charge just near the base of the flame where the fluid coming from the well is just becoming oxygen rich enough to burn. And that's put in a so-called shot drum, which is nothing more than a, 
a, either a 55 gallon or a 35 gallon barrel. The technique of using explosives to blow out fires has been around since the 1920s. Today, blowout specialists occasionally still use explosives, but most prefer less destructive methods. The same water pumps firefighters use to cool themselves put out the fires, too. Today, when you go put six, 8,000 gallons a minute, you can extinguish just about anything with that kind of water supply in the right place. <laughs> Takes a lot of the thrill out of it, but it's a little more practical, really. But the specialists also have to cap the well. Sometimes this is done while it's burning, if there's poisonous gas or it poses a larger environmental hazard to put it out. Many times the team has to cut off a damaged wellhead before attaching a new control device. Specialists often use a tool called an abrasive jet cutter to do this job. The tool uses high pressure water mixed with sand to sever the damaged wellhead. Next, capping stack with several blowout preventers, or BOPs, is forced over the blowing well and secured to the pipe. BOPs are also used during drilling to control well pressure. This type of BOP uses hydraulic rams that close and seal off the hole. And when you actually get the pleasure of shutting the blowout preventers in, it's the quietest quiet in the world. It's a, it's a very good feeling. Clearly, it's a dangerous line of work. And it always has been. Thousands of people have died fighting these fires over the past century and a half. In August 1859, oil speculator Edwin Drake drilled the first oil well in the United States. Two months later, it caught fire. Fire becomes a problem in the oil industry as soon as you bring oil to the surface. Um, it, it's, it's so combustible, and in the rush to develop, they spread oil all over everything, as far as you can see, getting that oil out as fast as they can, setting the stage for serious fires anytime there's any kind of a spark. The invention of the automobile further fueled demand for petroleum exploration. Huge reserves discovered in places like Beaumont, Texas in 1901 at Spindletop ushered in the age of the gusher. A gusher occurs when drillers hit a greater than expected pocket of oil or gas, and oil shoots back up the wellbore uncontrolled. To add to the fire hazard, well owners initially stored oil in open pits before storage tanks were built. In the early fields, all the way into the 1950s, most of the fields burned, in part at least, uh, is when they were developed. It was just almost impossible to keep this from happening. But in 1922, Cameron Ironworks invented the first effective blowout preventer, which reduced blowouts and made drilling operations safer. Fewer blowouts meant fewer fires. Conversely, if a well wasn't producing as much as the owner thought it was capable of, a specialized workman called a torpedo shooter was called in. Torpedo shooters dropped explosive nitroglycerin canisters, called torpedoes, down the well to induce flow. And they would literally drop that down the well bore to fracture the rock down there, or the sand, so that it could produce more. That was an interesting group of men. I think it was uh, once said that two out of three uh, torpedo shooters died before they were 30 years old. It was a terribly dangerous line of work. One of those daring oil field workers was a shooter named Carl Kinley. Carl was a widower who worked in the oil fields of Central California to support his three children. On April 29, 1913, Carl was helping clear a valve off a damaged oil rig from a small fire. 
Until this time, no one had found a very effective way of snuffing these fires. They felt like they may have a way of controlling the fire with steam if they were to get the fire going straight up. And so the procedure called for using explosives to blow a valve off the well. Carl loaded some nitroglycerin and carefully placed it by the rig. But when he detonated the nitro, an amazing thing happened. The fire went out. Moments later, the oil reignited. No one thought much of the fire having gone out, except for Carl's oldest son, Myron, who was standing nearby. 14-year-old Myron Kinley knew he had just witnessed something important. Little did he know, he'd seen the birth of a multi-million dollar industry he'd soon help create. In the late 19th century, the main product of petroleum oil was kerosene, which competed with whale oil as the prime source of illumination. Oil firefighting will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to oil firefighting on Modern Marvels. Myron Kinley, middle school dropout and oil patch shooter's assistant, almost single-handedly created the modern oil firefighting industry. The concept simmered in his mind after he witnessed his father inadvertently blow out a well fire using explosives. But it didn't happen overnight. First, Myron saw action during the First World War in an artillery unit gaining experience on how to set explosive charges. After the war, he joined his younger brother Floyd in a marginally successful torpedo shooting business, using explosives to stimulate well production. But one event would change the brothers' business plan. In 1924, Myron and Floyd watched as men struggled for 12 days to put out a burning well in Cromwell, Oklahoma using water and dirt. Remembering Carl's example 11 years earlier, Myron offered to put the fire out in two days for the then huge sum of $500. Myron realized his father's earlier torpedo had sucked up all the available oxygen, suffocating the fire. If Myron could just build a big enough torpedo, he could blow out the Cromwell fire and prevent it from immediately reigniting. The well owner agreed to the deal without expecting the crazy notion to work. But Myron proved his theory with a terrific explosion. At that moment, he knew he'd created his new line of work. He soon quit torpedo shooting and became a full-time oil well firefighter. By 1931, his business had grown to a point that he moved from Tulsa to Houston, the center of the oil well service industry. Within a few years, Myron and Floyd Kinley were legendary. Oil men all over the world knew to call Kinley if they had a blowout. The Kinley brothers honed their technique for dousing and capping fires throughout the late 20s and 30s. When they worked together, it was a very businesslike atmosphere. And one person was in charge, whether it was my father or my uncle. They had the utmost respect for one another. And I think they cared deeply about one another. The Kinleys found that relatively lightweight sheets of corrugated galvanized tin deflected heat better than other materials. The Kinleys also used hoses to create a constant and drenching artificial rain, keeping men and equipment from incinerating. The water also lessened chances of a spark reigniting a snuffed well. For this reason, the site around a burning well was always raked clean of debris so that nothing hot could start another fire. Though the process was slow and tedious, it 
meant life or death for the Kinleys. I think you got to clear away all the debris away from the wellhead and protect that wellhead at all times because that's what you want to work on. When it came time to actually blow out the well, Myram packed explosives into a shot canister. Dynamite caps were inserted into the shot to detonate the load when they had it where they wanted it. The canister was then delicately placed next to the burning fire. Initially, the brothers carried the explosives up to the mouth of the burning well, set it down under a constant stream of water, then ran like hell before the canister was detonated. Of course, the Kinley brothers were only half finished when the fire was out. Most people don't understand getting rid of the fire is the easiest thing, hell, you know, but the, you got to cap the well because it's still blowing, it just isn't on fire, and that's where the work comes in. Under a spray of volatile oil or gas, the Kinleys cut off the damaged wellhead. On this well, they used metal hacksaws. They had to be careful, as any spark could reignite the well, incinerating the men. The brothers then installed a new series of valves known as a Christmas tree. Finally, they shut the new Christmas tree, capping the gusher. Myron and Floyd were always careful, but sometimes the unexpected happened. In 1929, near Gladewater, Texas, Myron got hurt. He was hooking a cable onto debris when his leg was trapped. He could have very easily burned up had his brother Floyd not been there very quickly to take him out of that situation. He saved his life. Myron was fortunate to escape with only a broken leg. The brothers discovered the hard way, what worked and what didn't. They had a monopoly, if you will, on the business of oil welfare fighting all those years. But success had its price. In 1939, the dangers of the profession struck home for the Kinley family. Oh, his brother. Floyd got killed out in South Texas somewhere, backing off some drill pipe, and it come loose, and that's what hit him in the head, I think, killed him. Myron was battling another fire, too far away to save Floyd, the way Floyd had saved him years earlier. It was a terrible tragedy, the whole family. Floyd and Myron were very close. Um, it was a terrible thing. Myron's wife had the sad task of telling Floyd's wife the news. After dinner, I was sent out with someone to go to a movie so that uh, Aunt Marguerite would be there. Uh, the house would be quiet. Mother took that way of telling Aunt Marguerite about the loss of her, her husband. Aunt Marguerite thought she was going to see him uh, the next day, you know, go down there and all, and he was dead. With Floyd dead, Myron needed an experienced partner to help him with all the business coming his way. It seemed as if there was nobody else with the skills, bravery, and foolhardiness necessary. That is, until the greatest oil well firefighter who ever lived walked into Myron Kinley's office looking for a job. In 1931, Myron Kinley battled an oil well fire in Romania that had burned for more than two years. Myron capped the well within three months, capturing international attention. Oil firefighting will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to oil firefighting on Modern Marvels. Throughout the late 1930s and 1940s, Myron Kinley continued to use his tried and true methods to put oil fires out with modest technological advances. The introduction of heavy-duty Caterpillar tractors sped debris clearing considerably. In conjunction, Myron modified a logging trailer known as an athe wagon to suit his needs. The athe wagon was important in the history of the profession because it allowed the well control experts to place the charge exactly where it needed to be placed. And an athe wagon is simply a big, large boom 
that can be backed into the fire and it can be raised and lowered and manipulated into the, exactly the right spot. Athey wagons could also drag away debris. It's a tool still used today. This wagon is ready for transport. You see the A-leg, a we call it, on top. It basically it folds up vertically when it's in use. We have a series of block and tackle that have a one-inch cable that uh, goes to the drum or winch of a bulldozer. That conveys this boom up and down. Despite these advances, putting out oil well fires was still an extremely dangerous way to make a living in the late 1930s. No one knew this better than Myron Kinley. Myron was working on an oil well fire near Baytown, Texas. He was loading his shot canister full of explosives uh, in preparation of being able to shoot the fire out, and the canister prematurely went off. Myron survived, but suffered a severe leg injury and walked with a limp for the rest of his life. Fortunately, in 1946, Myron Kinley discovered the best technology he'd ever have. A five foot six inch Houston born redhead named Paul Red Adair. 31 year old Adair fought in Europe during the Second World War with an explosives unit. We picked up a little more knowledge with different shape charges and the schooling you went through in bomb disposal. So it helped me in fighting fires too. Red discovered he could actually shape a charge or direct the charge for a more efficient explosion or shot. In that drum, you've got, say, 250 pounds of, of dynamite. You need to put the caps in a proper place so that the explosion will be directed in the, in the direction that you want it to go. You don't put that thiel in the middle and just blow it up. <laughs> Myron saw as they worked together that Red had an instinct, a talent for explosives. There's an art in handling explosives a different way you have to use it. Working with Red in the shadow of a roaring, blowing well, Myron devised a communication system based on hand signals. At first, uh... Mr. Adair actually went on jobs with Myron, and then as, as more and more work came about, it was necessary for the two of them to split up occasionally, much like Myron did with his brother Floyd. Red Adair soon outshined the older injury-racked Myron Kinley, and he began to develop his own style for putting out fires. The hellish nature of their occupation drew the two men together. He liked him a lot. He, uh, there was a lot of camaraderie. There were jokes. There, was, there were, was, were good feelings uh, between them. And there had to be a great deal of trust. I think Myron Kinley, in many ways, thought of Red Adair as, as his son. And the two of them were very close. But Myron was unwilling to give up fighting fires entirely or give over the company to his protege. In 1951, as Myron curtailed his own schedule, Red hired Boots Hansen, a former field hand, to work as an assistant. I went with Mr. Kinley because he was crippling one thing or another. He'd been in it longer than Red, and he had no, a way that he did uh, a job. And when I worked for Red, I learned how to do it a, a different way. And, and a lot of times, it was a whole lot easier. In 1958, Coots Matthews, a worker for the Halliburton Oil Field Services Company, joined the Kinley Company as another assistant. Boots and I were their helpers. Just how it rotated. Sometime he went out with Mr. Kinley, and sometime he went out with Red. It just how it fell, you know. Also in 1958, Myron attempted to put out a monster of a fire in Iran called Awaz. Despite all his experience and his best efforts, Myron couldn't kill the fire. While making his second attempt at blowing the fire out, he suffered a mild heart attack. Physically and emotionally exhausted, 
62-year-old Myron called for Red back in Texas for help. And he came up to me and said, I think we met our match. I said, oh, no, we can get it. So we built up a big horseshoe shape charge. Red crafted a charge in the shape of a horseshoe to fit around the mouth of the well. He had five failures, then success. Boy, and he is happy. Got it this time. Boots and I capped it. Despite his heart attack in Iran, Myron was still not ready to retire. But Red Adair was ready to move on. In 1959, Red abruptly left the M.M. Kinley Company and formed his own oil firefighting company, taking Boots Hansen with him. Coots Matthews followed within a year. For the first time, the Kinley Company had real competition. Two legitimate oil firefighting companies now competed for business. I think my father was disappointed and hurt, perhaps, not so much that Red left him, left the company, because I think that was inevitable. But I think it was somehow something happened in the way it was done that um, hurt my father. I think he wished him well, and, and once it was over, I, I think it was all right with him. Myron Kinley, the man who almost single-handedly created the methods and techniques for fighting oil well fires, continued fighting fires on his own. He finally retired in 1962 at age 66. Myron spent his remaining years developing well service tools. Red Adair spent his time becoming the most famous oil well firefighter who ever lived, putting out the biggest oil well fires the world had ever seen. In 1936, Kilgore, Texas was known as the world's richest acre, with 24 individual oil wells crowding a single block in the middle of town. Oil firefighting will return on Modern Marvels. Now return to oil firefighting on Modern Marvels. In 1962, Red Adair, Boots Hansen, and Coots Matthews were facing down a monster of a gas well fire in Algeria called the Devil's Cigarette Lighter. That was a tremendous fire, one that went on for several months, and it was so large and so ferocious that really most people didn't think that it could ever be controlled. This roaring giant shot flames and smoke 800 feet into the air as 550 million cubic feet of gas spewed out each day in the scorching desert heat. The pressure was so great, men had to be careful not to be sucked up into the flames. And it was the biggest one, and she would flare out and try to pick you off the ground, so much volume coming out. The fire would be a showcase for the techniques and tools Myron invented and Red perfected. Without access to water, the men had to drill for it. To hold the water, they dug three pits, each about the size of a football field and 10 feet deep. Red's team cooled the site with high-pressure water cannons and protected the equipment with corrugated tin. Red's men used an athe wagon and bulldozers to pull away the debris of the burned-up rig. After several months of preparation, they were finally ready to shoot out the fire with nitroglycerin charges. We shot out with 750 pounds of 100% glycerin. Now that the well was no longer burning, the men attempted to cap it. Red employed a sand line cutter, a tool he had been using for several years. The sand line cutter was a sand resin coated cable looped around the wellhead. Winches on opposite sides pulled the cable back and forth, cutting the wellhead off like a bandsaw. The men then forced a blowout preventer over the blowing well and secured it to the pipe. A delicate operation when even static electricity could reignite the well and kill everyone around. Finally, after six months, 
the devil's cigarette lighter stopped roaring. The amazing feat captured the world's attention and propelled Red Adair to international celebrity. Red made television appearances, and Hollywood even produced the movie, Hellfighters, starring John Wayne, which was loosely based on Red's life. In between Red's celebrity appearances, he joined Boots and Coots in putting out fires. These jobs sent them in all directions. On one occasion, Coots traveled with Red overseas to put out a well fire in Africa. Red, before we could get on the airplane going down in the desert, to, down to Algiers, well, we got another job in uh, Mexico. And hell, I turned around and got back on the airplane. But when he landed in New York, Coots learned that the fire in Mexico had gone out and he wasn't needed anymore. So I got back on the airplane and uh, headed back to Paris and I guess just got seated on that damn plane. This girl asked me, was that my first transatlantic crossing? I said, well, if I make it, it'd be my third one this day. <laughs> <laughs> and she thought I was a nut. She never asked me a damn question after that, but it was the truth. Despite the camaraderie developed from years of risking their lives together, Boots Hansen and Coots Matthews abruptly departed the Red Adair Company in 1978. Their business uh, immediately took off and, and became very successful. He said, what are we going to name the company? I said, we got to call it Boots and Coots. And he Which... says, how about Coots and Boots? <laughs> and I thought, of course, the B comes before the C, so he was the president. Which wasn't a very good honor either. But they weren't Red's only competition. In 1975, with 23 years of experience as a drilling engineer, Joe Bowden Sr. started Wild Well Control in Houston. Bowden's Wild Well Control would grow to become one of the most successful band of blowout specialists in the world. By the late 1980s, more than half a dozen firefighting companies had formed to meet the demand of the industry worldwide. With the next generation of firefighters ready to take over, Red, Boots, and Coots might have been contemplating retirement. But they'd have to wait just a little longer. In March of 1991, Saddam Hussein created the mother of all oil well fires. Iraqi soldiers retreating out of occupied Kuwait during the Gulf War set every oil well they could find on fire. The country was one gigantic fiery blowout. The world turned to Texas for help. We flew all over looking over. When you first get in, it was a heck of a bad looking sight. Even all of us that have worked on well fires and blowouts all our whole life, uh, no one ever saw hundreds of wells burning at a single time. Experts estimated it might take as long as 10 years to put out all the fires and stop the environmental devastation. But the fires weren't their only concern. When a well wasn't on fire, it would be a, oil would be a foot and a half deep all around it and you didn't know what you're stepping on, they had landmines everywhere. But despite the dangers of a former war zone and the hellish appearance of the landscape, the firefighters soon realized that this inferno might be easier to extinguish than they originally thought. Hussein's men had blown off the tops of the wells, which set them on fire, but left the structure underneath the surface relatively intact. The introduction of the first new firefighting tool in decades also made the job easier. Most of the equipment that we use on a day-to-day -day basis has been around since the 20s. There's no new technology except for the uh, hydraulic jet cutter that was developed during the first Gulf War. And you can cut a wellhead off now in 30 minutes as opposed to 30 hours. The abrasive jet cutter uses high-pressure jets of water mixed with sand to physically sandblast through the metal with 10,000 pounds per square inch of pressure. The abrasive jet cutter invented by the Halliburton Company 
was a new tool the industry desperately needed. The Texas companies were joined by a top Canadian company, Safety Boss. But the overwhelming scope of the disaster encouraged other less experienced international teams to get involved. They achieved far more success gaining publicity than they did putting out fires. A Hungarian company came with a jet engine rig to literally blow out fires. Hey, that was funny, comical. They called it a big win, that's what it was. A jet engine, it got all the publicity about what all it did over there. And, and the actual truth was it put out three small fires. And it took quite a while to do that. In the meantime, the big four knocked fires down and capped wells. We get four and five wells a day. That's how we got through with them so quick. The disaster that threatened to last a decade was out within six months. Red Boots and Coots made a fortune putting fires out in Kuwait, a suitable cap to their long and illustrious careers. The safety boss, Wild Well Control, Red Adair, and Boots and Coots companies snuffed 67% of the 750 fires in Kuwait. Oil firefighting will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to oil firefighting on Modern Marvels. Beaumont, Texas. These firefighters are at the opposite end of the petroleum business. Not at a well, but at a processing unit. A huge explosion has ripped open a local refinery. The resulting fire threatens to destroy the rest of the plant. They've got a one-two punch to knock this fire out. First, they hit the inferno with water and foam. Then apply a purple punch of dry chemical. Within minutes, the fire's out. It may take you six or eight hours to rig up, but when you attacked it, it's over quick or you're doing something wrong. Fortunately, this refinery fire is just a simulation. It's being conducted at the Center for Industrial Fire and Hazardous Materials Training at Beaumont's Lamar University. Here, a different breed of firefighter learns how to put out a different type of fire. In an industrial situation, firefighters could face both a pressure fire, a liquid fire in motion, sometimes under pressure, and a static fire, such as a tank fire. Fortunately, these guys are learning from one of the best, Dwight Williams of Williams Fire and Hazard Control. There's been a couple of fires that I said, you're either going to kill me or I'm going to kill you. And it's come to that. Dwight's been fighting fires since the 1970s. His specialty is killing storage tank fires, the biggest ones on record. One of the most dangerous events Dwight may face during a storage tank fire is the possibility of a boil over. During a torrential storm, the weight of rainwater can sometimes cause a floating roof to fail, exposing the oil inside. A boil over may occur when a crude oil storage tank burns out of control for hours. The boiling oil on top creates a hot thermal wave, which sinks and reaches a layer of water near the bottom of the tank, essentially causing a steam explosion. So rather than the fuel burning inside the walls of the tank on the surface of the fluid, it will cause that to basically erupt and expel or eject all of the fuel that's in there all over everything and then generally involves many more because there are lots and lots of storage tanks near each other. The objective is to put the fire out before a boil over occurs. To do that, Williams Fire has developed a host of tools and techniques. The best protective clothing that you can buy is distance. 
we like to kill fires long distance. We like to do it with the artillery. These are Williams' big guns, trailer-mounted water cannons, or monitors, capable of delivering up to 6,000 gallons of water per minute. The nozzle and monitor package itself is on a quick action package where we can move it vertically uh, with just one person, and it'll go 360 degrees around. We mix foam here at the nozzle uh, with the water, make a foam solution delivered as a finished foam. It's got the ability to flow 1,000 through 6,000 gallons per minute, and it's portable. The foam concentrate contains a detergent-like hydrocarbon surfactant. When it lands, it actually runs across the surface of the flammable liquid fire. It blankets that flammable liquid fire to the point where it suppresses vapor and occludes the oxygen. So we don't get that vapor-air mixture and have a continuance of burning. Once we eliminate the oxygen from the surface of that fire and suppress the vapors, the fire goes out. Besides foam, Williams Fire also uses a dry chemical called PKW for the final punch. The dry chemical temporarily interrupts the chain reaction of the combustion process of a fire. It has a purple dye, so firefighters can easily see it in the stream of water. This is PKW, the dry chemical of choice for Williams Fire and Hazard Control. We use it whenever we need a chemical to eliminate a pressure fire. This is a very fine powder. Uh, it's introduced through our hydrochem nozzle into our foam stream to eliminate that chemical chain reaction. Firefighters shoot both foam and dry chemical through the high pressure water cannons. But killing many fires requires hand-to-hand -hand combat. If this is their heavy artillery, then this is their bayonet. The water foam solution comes in here, and it goes out here around this little pipe. The valve for it is marked water foam, and you open it first, and you start knocking the fire down. Once the fire gets knocked down, you visualize exactly where your pressure fires are as you get ready to shoot them out. You simply pop them and shoot them out. In the early days, firefighters often couldn't stop storage tank fires, and they burned to exhaustion. Before specialists, thousands of firefighters working for the refineries dealt with those dangerous fires in the course of their normal jobs, without notoriety or lots of money. When I was growing up in uh, Port Natchez, Texas, my father got a job as a fireman. And when you'd hear those sirens, you'd know something had occurred. And my first thought would be, okay, you know, will my dad make it through this? And my second thought would be, this, are any of my friends' fathers involved? Because in our schools, all the fathers worked in the refinery. So there would always be a couple of fathers missing who had been killed in refinery explosions. In the 20th century, several innovations helped decrease the chances of fire including separating the refinery from the storage tanks. Also, the introduction of floating roofs, which went up and down with a level of product inside, kept explosive vapors from accumulating. Putting out a large tank fire takes experience, guts, and a little guesswork. Success could have made these guys a little bit arrogant in the face of a fire. Not Dwight. He has plenty of respect for it and knows when it's time to get back. There's nothing exciting about going to meet your maker a little prematurely. I mean, I'd really like seeing, but I'd, I want to do it later in, in my years. Whether it's well fires or refinery fires, the firefighters who put out these infernos are like none other. Sure, they use modern tools and technologies, but there's also a little something extra. Hard intuition, hard bravery, and a bit of Texas bravado. 
given half a chance, these guys could probably put out hell itself.